Okay, so we're covering chapter four, the first two years, the social part of it. So what we're going to notice is in the first two years of life, emotions can change on a monthly basis from month to month. The thing, the key is that we need to adjust with them and the caregivers need to change with them. So at birth, we know that they can be distressed. We know that they can show contentment and be happy. At about six weeks, they develop what we call the social smile. They are happy when they see their caregivers or humans in general. About three months, they have laughter and develop a curiosity. About four months, they actually have full-blown smiles. Four to eight months, they can show anger. Nine to 14 months, they have this fear of social events. They do not like strangers much. They're afraid to be separated from their caregiver, things like that. 12 months, they have the unexpected sights and sound fear. And then at about 18 months, they develop a self-awareness. They can feel shame. They can be proud of themselves. They can feel embarrassed. Um, so we have complex emotions that start to actually arise. So early emotions, they have a high emotional responsiveness. They feel pain. They feel pleasure. They cry, of course, usually if they're hurt or hungry, tired, scared. Colic is when they have an uncontrollable crying. Oftentimes it's from reflux. They do not know how to fully swallow, and so it kind of comes back up. Oftentimes it's excessive to the point that their caregivers start to have issues. Smiling and laughing, the social smile at about six weeks once again, usually by viewing humans, seeing caregivers. Laughter at three to four months, it often starts as a curiosity and it's usually pretty brief. Some other emotions will usually start to take over but they can actually laugh. At around six months, we see the first expression of anger. Um, usually it's fully developed by eight months, but it's actually a healthy response in infants. It's a response to their frustration. If they get frustrated because they can't do something, if they're restricted from moving, that kind of thing, they get really angry. Sadness usually indicates withdrawal, and there's a hormone in our body called cortisol that is released in response to stress. So infants that are sad often have these cortisol releases. So it's very stressful for infants. Adults, as adults, we are supposed to know how to handle stressful situations. We're supposed to know how to handle sadness, and infants really don't know what to do with this. So sad and angry infants with depressed mothers actually became fearful toddlers. So you kind of want to try to help the infant handle their stress in a way. Um, again, the cortisol that's released, there's really nothing we can do about that. But if you can try to make it not as stressful for them, you know, of course, make you try to make them happy, of course, is what we want to try to do. Fear at about nine months in response to people, things, situations. Stranger wariness. Um, if, you, if an infant sees a stranger, they no longer just smile because it's a friendly face. They cry and look frightened if an unfamiliar person gets too close to them. Separation anxiety. We've heard of this many times probably, but if they're separated from their caregiver, they may cry, throw tantrums, get really angry if they leave. If it remains really strong after about three, then it may be considered an emotional disorder. But at around the age of one, it's normal for this to happen. It's normal for infants to be wary of strangers. It's normal for them to not want to be separated from their caregivers. Anxious parents can actually lead to um, their children fearing new people. So you kind of don't want to be anxious around your infants because you don't want it to, you don't want them to pick up on it and you don't want it to sort of wear off on them. Fear of separation, if it interferes with an infant's sleep, 
Like if they fall asleep with the parent and then wake up alone, oftentimes they'll get scared. Um, so you have to find a balance. Oftentimes this is where a teddy bear or a security blanket or a bobo a pacifier, that's oftentimes when those will come into play because they help the infant cope with the anxiety and cope with waking up alone. They see the familiar item and don't get as scared. Toddlers' emotions, so as they get older, anger and fear become less frequent but more focused. So when they do get angry or scared, it's you know specifically for a reason. Laughing and crying can become louder. You can start to tell kind of what kind of laugh they're doing, what they're crying for kind of thing. And this is a point in time where temper tantrums could appear. Temper tantrums, there isn't really any logic behind them. Um, but if you tease them about it, the temper tantrum could get worse. When it's over, you want to comfort the toddler as opposed to punishing them. And oftentimes when your children are having temper tantrums, if you just kind of ignore them and leave them be, then when they're done, they'll come to you for comfort. And that's probably the best way to handle them. You do not want to give in to temper tantrums because if you do, then the child learns that that is how they get things. That's how they get what they want. They can throw a tantrum and get what they want. And that could last into almost adulthood if you do that. So make sure that you treat temper tantrums appropriately. You know, you don't want to haul off and start smacking them or punish them. You want to comfort them. But during the tantrum, you kind of want to, you don't want to give into it or play up to it. You just want to kind of ignore them, leave them be. And then when they're done, kind of, once they're tired out, so to speak, they come to you for comfort and give it to them. It's also the period of time where they have a social awareness of their culture. They may start to feel pride, shame, disgust, guilt, embarrassment. Um, so this is where we're going from our instincts to we're actually learning and, you know, sensing, perceiving, cognitive thinking is starting to develop. So as I said, they develop a self-awareness, which is they realize that they have a distinct body, mind, and actions that are different from others. They're separated from others. And this has kind of started to show in the mere recognition experiment. Babies between 9 and 24 months were put in front of a mirror. And they looked into the mirror after they had a dot of blush put on their noses. If the baby was younger than 12 months old, they did not react as if they realized that the mark was actually on them. However, 15 to 24 month old babies showed that the mark was on them. They touched their noses. So if they were younger than a year old, they didn't realize that was them they were looking at in the mirror. But if they were 15 to 24 months old, they knew it was them they were looking in the mirror so they would touch their nose to kind of get the rouge off, the blush off. So as they're getting older, they're starting to become aware of themselves. They're starting to be able to regulate their emotions a little better so that by the age of four, they should actually be able to regulate their emotions pretty well. So everything begins in the brain. Synapses and dendrites are related to this expression of emotion and the refinement of the emotions as they get older. Past experiences have everything to do with it. Ongoing maturation. So as your dendrites are growing and making connections, you're going to be able to deal with your emotions better. Experience and culture do promote specific connections between neurons and emotions because certain cultures view things differently. Um, Chinese cultures, you know, view women and men one certain way. And what they actually found was that in Chinese culture, they learned that they are closely aligned with their mothers. Um, so when asked if they were like their mothers, they, they put brain um, scans on them, and when they were asked if they were like their mothers, 
the prefrontal cortex in Chinese culture, it was activated, but in the US it wasn't. So Chinese children realize they're more closely aligned with their mothers than US children do, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. We know in the US, I guess, we're kind of encouraged to be more independent as opposed to Chinese culture where they're more relying on their mothers. Um, so it's kind of an interesting finding that our brains kind of align like that. In the US children, when they're asked if they're reliant on their mother, they don't react as much as the Chinese do. So that's kind of interesting. So emotions are affected by past experiences, as we know. They're also affected by genes and hormones and neurotransmitters. Hormones are our long distance communicators released by the endocrine system, and neurotransmitters are the chemical impulses of the brain. So that's how um, the central nervous system communicates. If you have excessive fear and stress, your brain can get harmed. Abuse, which is actually a form of chronic stress, may cause long-term effects on the child's development. It often creates high levels of those stress hormones, that cortisol I was talking about, and it can often lead to later behavioral difficulties. You, the, the thing that we need to figure out is how to balance out raising our child in a comforting environment that isn't um, smothering, but that isn't, you know, ignoring, almost neglectful. So you have to find that balance because you definitely do not want to smother your children, but you also don't want to just, you know, let all else go. So finding that level that's a good level in the middle so that your child grows up to be healthy and happy is a trick. Um, so we know that hormones definitely have an impact. We know that cortisol has an impact on stress even as adults. And so we really need to pay attention to our children and we need to pay attention to their emotional responses. We need to learn that separation is okay to an extent, you know, but you should still comfort your children. Temperament is different from personality. Temperament is the biologically based core of individual differences. Um, we have different styles of approach and different responses to environments and it's stable pretty much across time and situations. So temperamental traits are genetic personality traits, however, are learned. So you may have heard that, you know, that child has a bad temperament or an uneven temperament. So they may be shy or aggressive. When we're talking about personality, you know, we're talking about things like honesty and humility versus temperament, shy and aggressiveness. So temperament versus personality, two different things. So we found three dimensions of temperament. Effort for con effortful control, negative mood, and exuberant. Effort for, why can't I talk? Effortful control has to do with regulating your attention, regulating your emotions, and if you can be self-soothing. Negative mood is fearful, angry, unhappy, and exuberant are active and social and not shy whatsoever. This is most strongly linked to genes. So we've done a lot of lab studies where infants were actually exposed to frightening or attractive four-month-olds, um, like little mobiles and unusual sounds. Older babies, there was a noisy robot or a clown moving really close to them really fast. And then we kind of watched to see if they laughed or if they cried or if they were quiet or if they had a combination of all of these. And we kind of figured that each dimension 
later affects us to the, you know, to into adulthood. It affects our personality, it affects how much we can achieve, and it's associated with certain behaviors. Synchrony is the coordinated, rapid, smooth exchange of responses between a caregiver and an infant. So it's important to be in sync with your baby. In the first few months, it becomes more frequent and elaborate, and it helps the infants learn to kind of read people, to read their emotions and develop skills so that they can social, inter socially interact with others. It usually begins with parents imitating infants, and usually um, the adults will respond to the infant's facial expressions and emotions. So if you think of being in sync with your child, think of if you're dancing with someone. If you're dancing with someone, you don't want to be stepping all over each other's feet. You want to be in rhythm and sync. So it's the same thing with your baby. So they did experiments using the still face technique to answer the question, is synchrony needed for normal development? The answer is yes. They had an adult keep his or her face expressionless while they were interacting with an infant. And babies got really upset and started to show signs of distress. Um, Parents' responsiveness to the infant kind of helps psychological and biological development. And the infant's brain actually needs that social interaction in order to develop normally. If the infant was confronted with this still face and expressionless, and they, you know, they would try to get the adult to react to them. So they would start crying, they would start getting upset, showing fear, and, you know, trying to get the adults to react with them. So they found out that synchrony is experience expectant, which remember experience expectant means it's required for normal development. And it's the same across the board, every culture pretty much, it doesn't matter. Everyone needs this synchrony. Attachment is another thing. Attachment is lifelong. It's an emotional bond that one person has with another. It begins to form in early infancy and influences the person's relationships throughout their lives. So getting this good sense of attachment is very important for normal development. So we have stages of attachment, of course, just like we have stages of everything else. So we have pre-attachment in the first six weeks, up to eight months attachment in the making, eight months to two years, the classic secure attachment, two to six years attachment as a launching pad, six to 12 years a mutual attachment, 12 to 18 years you have new attachment figures coming into play, and then once you turn 18 you kind of revisit your attachment and how, how attached you are. So we show attachment through proximity seeking. You want to be by people. You kind of follow your caregiver around. You approach your caregiver. You try to maintain contact, touching them, holding them kind of thing. Um, cry if you're unhappy. Oftentimes if a caregiver will leave the room or go to the bathroom, cry at the door, that kind of thing. So in order to kind of help the infant know you're still there if you sing or talk to them through the door, you know, kind of reassure them that you're still there, oftentimes that will help. So we did find that we have different attachment types, four of them. Insecure avoidant attachment is when the infant avoids connection with the caregiver. So the infant doesn't really care if the caregiver's there, if they leave, if they leave and come back. They don't really care. Only about one third of individuals have this type of attachment along with the insecure, resistant, ambivalent attachment. So one third combined. So half of one third have this insecure, avoidant attachment. So that's a good thing. 
they will often play independently and you don't need to check on them and they don't really want you to check on them. They don't care if you do. The second kind is secure attachment where the infant gets both comfort and confidence while the caregiver is there. About two thirds of infants have this type of attachment and this is what we really want. This is signified by if they're with their caregiver, they can get down and play for a little while and still be okay. They can get back up on their caregiver's lap but get down and they're not necessarily going to cry if you put them down. They're going to get down and kind of see what's going on. The insecure resistant ambivalent attachment is the other one third with that insecure avoidant attachment. This is when an infant's anxiety is evident. You can see it a mile away. The infant becomes extremely upset at separation from the caregiver and kind of doesn't want to get back with them and wants to get back with them at the same time. They're clingy to the caregiver. They get angry at the caregiver. If they leave and come back, they might hit the caregiver, that kind of thing. And the last type is disorganized attachment. This is only five to 10%, so not really a lot but it's basically an inconsistent reaction to the caregiver's departure and return. So this is when you switch from kissing the mom to hitting the mom. Um, you kind of go back and forth between, you just kind of stare blankly, you start to cry hysterically. You're punching them and you, then you're not moving. So it's kind of a switching all over the place. And as the name implies, disorganized. The strange situation was a laboratory experiment to measure attachment. They looked at infants' reactions to the stress of different adults coming and going when they were in an unfamiliar playroom. So the key observations were a secure toddler plays happy. So they started to play with toys and kind of look around and they were okay. If the caregiver left, a secure toddler missed them. And if the caregiver came back, a secure toddler welcomed them and hugged them as opposed to, you know, hitting them or anything else. So they noticed the caregiver left, kind of looked concerned, but then when the caregiver came back, they were reassured. So here is our toddler playing happily. Caregiver leaves, they miss her, kind of wondering what's going on, but not having a you know, fit or anything. They're kind of troubled. And then when the caregiver comes back, they're comforted. It also showed us that toys aren't a substitute for a mother's comfort. Um, so if the infant is secure, handing them a toy isn't going to get them to stop crying. They want their mother, but you know they're not going to totally lose their mind. They're gonna just be a little bit troubled, a little bit worried, is she coming back kind of thing. And then when she comes back, they're relieved. So again, attachment is gonna affect early brain development. Insecure infants, however, are not totally doomed. Secure infants are more likely gonna be successful, but this can change. The stresses of poverty reduce the incidence of secure attachment. So if you're in a bad situation, you're not gonna easily be as securely attached. And insecure attachment does correlate with many other problems, but again, they're not doomed, that can change. If situations change, if the environment changes, if the care level changes, that can change. So insecure attachment can be a sign of problems, but is not necessarily the cause of any later problems. Attachment behaviors in a strange situation are only one indication of the quality of the parent-child relationship. So again, correlation is not causation. Just because two things are correlated does not mean that one causes the other. Very important. In the late 1980s, they actually did a study on Romanian children who were part of international adoptions. 
And what they found was that infants adopted before six months fared the best. Those that were adopted after 12 months often suffered from a variety of adverse outcomes. So it kind of shows you that secure attachment in that first six months of life is really important. And we've kind of learned that making sure that the infants feel secure early on is very important to later outcomes. Okay, social referencing. When infants seek emotional responses from other people, they kind of look to see what someone else is doing and how someone else is reacting to see what they should be doing and how they should be reacting. So mothers will use a variety of expressions and gestures to convey social information to their infants. Um, for example, you know, it's time for dinner and they may yell. Oftentimes, if an older child is in trouble, they'll use their middle name. I used to do that myself with my kids. If they, were, if they heard me call their middle name, they knew they were in trouble. Um, so infants, even young infants, look at other people to see how they're reacting to the situation to kind of figure out what they're supposed to be doing. So fathers, of course, within every ethnic group, contemporary fathers are more involved than previously. This is uh, influenced by a lot of different things, so social context, role models. We do not have the strict gender roles that we used to have back in the day where the father worked and the mother took care of the house and kids. And we have a lot of cultural variations now. So we can have what's called allocare, which is when your children are cared for by other people. So this happens a lot, more now than it did before. So over the past 20 years, father-infant research has tried to answer three questions. Can men provide care for infants as well as women? And the answer is yes. Is father-infant interaction different from mother-infant interaction? And the answer is yes. Fathers often wrestle with their children and have more exciting play than mothers do. And how do fathers and mothers cooperate to provide infant care? Well, it depends. It depends on the family. But the key is that every family has to find a way to handle the care of a child and work together, even if the father and mother aren't together. They need to find a way to work together to figure out and handle the care of that child. So, theories of infant psychosocial development. The first thing I want to ask you is, do you think people can change? Your book says that some children are more difficult to raise and harder to live with, in part because of inborn temperamental characteristics. So the question I'm asking you is, do you think people can change? Our temperament is genetic. It's inborn. So shy aggressiveness, that's kind of genetic within us. Temperament versus personality. So do you, I'm not asking you if people's personalities can change. I'm saying, do you think people can change their temperament? Do you think if someone is shy, they're going to have those shy tendencies their entire life. Or if someone is aggressive, they're going to have those aggressive tendencies their whole life. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to send me a message through Canvas. And I want you to answer that question. Do you think people can change their temperament? And I want you to answer it after you've thought about it for a minute. So I want at least a paragraph from you. Do not say, yes, they can, no, they can't. I want you to stop and think about it. I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about someone you know. And I want you to think about your temperament or their temperament. And I want you to think if you could change yours, if there's anything you could do. And if there is, what is it? What could you do? If you know somebody, what could they do? 
Or do you think it's impossible to change it? Your book says that some children are just difficult. Do you think they're difficult the rest of their lives? So answer that with a paragraph. Do you think people can change their temperament? And I'm going to let you drop your lowest quiz at the end of the semester. I will keep track of it, do not worry. But I'll let you drop your lowest quiz. Now, the key is, you have to send me the message before, what day is today? Today is Monday. You have to send me the message before Thursday, no, Friday. We'll say before Friday to get the free dropped quiz. If you send me it at 12.01 on Saturday, it doesn't count. I want it by 11.59 Friday night. Okay? Okay. So, last thing we're going to talk about are the theories of infant psychosocial development. Freud, of course, the oral and anal stages, the first and second years of life. You have potential conflicts, and if you do not successfully resolve these conflicts, or if it is, if potty training, for example, is too strict, if it's too early, if the toddler refuses, they're going to have what we call an anal personality. They're going to want to control everything as an adult. Or if you do not successfully navigate the oral stage, you'll have an oral fixation. So you're going to want to constantly eat or you're going to over talk or over talk, talk excessively. So Freud believed that you had to successfully navigate through these two stages of your life. And if you didn't, you were stuck in them the rest of your life. Erickson, on the other hand, believed that you had certain crises that you had to navigate. So there was a developmental crisis, but he thought they were a little different. He had the trust versus mistrust and the autonomy versus shame and self-doubt. So in trust versus mistrust, infants learn if they can trust their caregivers, basically if their basic needs are met. So if they're fed, if they're clothed, if they're shelter, they learn they can trust their caregivers. If they don't, they'll be mistrustful. Autonomy versus shame and self-doubt happens when toddlers want to do everything for themselves. They want to be able to feed themselves. They want control over their actions, control over their bodies. And if you fail to get that, then you grow up shameful, doubtful, um, you don't think you can really do anything, you don't trust in yourself, you are ashamed very easily. So you can grow up to be suspicious and mistrusting, or you can grow up to be shameful and not confident in yourself if you don't navigate these two stages. So a little bit different than Freud, but they both believed that problems in these first two years of life could lead to problems for your whole life. So that's kind of very important. Behaviorism, social learning theory, Bandura. He believed that parents mold an infant's emotions and personality through reinforcements and punishments. Another person who agreed with the reinforcement idea was Skinner. Remember Skinner with operant conditioning. He fully believed in reinforcements. So he thought that a child could learn language through positive reinforcement. Basically, he believed that everything could be learned through reinforcement. So here, Bandura also believed that you could mold the personality through reinforcement or punishing bad behaviors. So behavior patterns are often acquired by observing others. And he believed that gender roles in particular are learned. So we have what's called proximal versus distal parenting. Proximal is kind of the hands-on, frequent contact parenting style. Distal is you're kind of more off-put. You do not have a lot of contact parenting style. So the key is to look at what your child is doing and 
you know, kind of react to that appropriately, I guess is what I'm saying. Sometimes you need to kind of let them go when they're having their temper tantrums. Other times you need to hug them and comfort them. So we just have to learn this. Um, of course, make sure that they have their physical needs met, of course. Um, and what you want really is kind of a combination of the two, proximal and distal parenting. Because again, you want to hold them and touch them, but you don't want to be smothering. And sometimes, like I said, if they're having a tantrum, you should let them be. They need to work it out, so to speak. Um, yeah. And then cognitive theory. Cognitive theory, again, Piaget cared about how infants think as opposed to what they think or what they know. So we have the set of assumptions that the individual uses to organize what they perceive and what they experience. And the interpretation of these is more important than the experiences themselves. So if a child falls, off a, falls out of a tree, for example, how they interpret that is more important than the actual falling out of the tree, you know, for an extensive example. So new models can be developed based on new experiences or reevaluating your old experiences. So again, let's say you fall out of a tree and then two weeks later you fall off your bike. You know, you can't interpret those in the same kind of way or you can interpret them differently. You can interpret the, well, maybe you shouldn't have been climbing the tree versus you're perfectly fine riding the bike. So even as the child is growing older, the way they're interpreting these experiences is kind of more important than the experience themselves. So it's kind of how you look at it. And then we have daycare. Daycare is becoming used more and more frequently, but the thing is you have to make sure you have a high quality daycare. And high quality daycare have these characteristics. Adequate attention to each infant, so you do not want a daycare that has one daycare worker and 30 kids. Encouragement of language and sensory motor development, so you want an interactive daycare. Attention to health and safety, of course, you want your child safe at all times and you want to make sure that they are healthy, getting good food. You don't want a daycare that just feeds Pop-Tarts kind of thing. They should be professional caregivers and warm and responsive. Oftentimes we leave our children with grandmothers, um, but sometimes you know you have to leave them with daycare. You just do not have an option. So make sure you check out the daycare because you know your infant's development's at risk. So in the United States, 20% of infants are cared for exclusively by their mothers during the first year. We do not have a federal maternal leave policy. So each job is basically up, you know, it's up to them on if they want to give you maternity leave. We do have the FMLA Act, but that's unpaid. So we do not have any paid leave. So oftentimes it's very difficult for the mother to take the time off of work other than, you know, the six weeks or whatever you're given. In Canada, most newborns are cared for exclusively by their mothers because they have a generous maternal leave policy. In Norway, new mothers are paid their full salary to stay at home for 47 weeks, and then they have high quality free center care provided after that point. So 47 weeks, that's a long time, that's you know close to a year that they're paid full salary to stay home. And then after that, they have free daycare, which is high quality. I mean, that's incredible. In Australia, they're actually paid to have children. $5,000 for each newborn. They have paid parental leave, mom and dad, and public subsidies for child care. So the, the, there's quite a difference between countries, between cultures, as you can see. So individualized care with stabilized caregivers, of course, is going to be the best. Relationships are very important. Infants need that responsiveness. And if you do not have stable maternal care, 
that is a big problem. So I want you guys to message me before Friday night at 11.59. Answer that question, do you think people can change as I described more fully earlier on? Bye.